Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Eddie Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Thursday, June 6th, and that means... It's almost Pentecost. It is almost Pentecost. Uh, so getting all things red, yes. ready, like all the red pyramids and everything, and also um, getting ready for those Pentecost hymns. Yay. Joining us by phone today, Matthew Mockmer, Associate Cantor, Concordia Theological Seminary. Matt, thanks so much for being our guest. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. We're excited to talk about Pentecost hymns. What do you look forward to in Pentecost hymns most What as, as a cantor? Well, you know, the Pentecost hymns do present a, a, a strange challenge, I think, and that's maybe one of the things that I like the most about them is that there's a few, in my mind, kind of quintessential Pentecost hymns, but because they're for Pentecost, you hardly ever get to sing them. Mm. You no, know, Pentecost is one day of the year. And sometimes we think about it as being this really long season. But really that green season that follows Pentecost is just that, the season after Pentecost. Pentecost is really just one day. And so you kind of get one shot, maybe two, to get some of these hymns in every year. Um, Because of that, I love them because I don't get to sing them three, four times a year. And so I always look forward to having the opportunity to revisit those old friends. But, you know, as somebody who's always thinking about leading the church's song and helping the people to sing more confidently, that presents its own unique challenge because it's, you know, you get one or two shots a year to teach those things if your folks aren't familiar with it. So, you know, it's, it's a great thing, but it's a, it's always kind of a a yearly challenge in how to do that. So what you're saying is that we need to have a Pentecost hymn sing every year and just sing all of them. (laughs) Yes, I think so. And then in true Pentecost fashion, we should sing them all at the same time. In different languages? Oh, wait. Yeah, and then in our chosen languages. That would actually be really fun. We should do that. And confusing. (laughs) I think it's about five people in the the church who think that would be fun, and then everyone else would just be shaking their head. (laughs) Wondering what's happening. Um, So these these Pentecost hymns... uh, and on a personal note, I really love them too. So many of them have such great tunes, uh, mm-hmm. tunes that we don't necessarily find in a lot of other hymns in the hymnal. Absolutely. Yeah, very, very interesting tunes, mm-hmm. some very sturdy tunes. Mm-hmm. And I think some of the ones we're going to talk to talk about today all exhibit, I mean, there's three hymns that I gave you guys as a list, and they all exhibit very different musical characteristics, um, not just uh, textual characteristics, but unique musical characteristics to each of them, too. Absolutely. So let's jump in to uh, Lutheran Service Book 497, Come Holy Ghost, God and Lord. Uh, what What do you want to want us to know off the bat about, about this hymn? Well, this is kind of Martin Luther's quintessential Pentecost hymn. Um, it's uh, taken, as a lot of Luther's hymns were, taken from a very old medieval Latin antiphon, Veni Sancte Spiritus. Um, and stanza one of this hymn is Luther's, basically his translation, and um, he cleaned up some of the language to, um, it wasn't profane or anything, <laughs> but, you know, made it more uh, um, uh, faithful, maybe to the scriptures. Um, and then stanzas two and three are Luther's own Um, own words, his own writing. Um, And the tune is based on the same medieval Latin antiphon, this old chant melody, but again, kind of metricized for congregational singing. Um, And it has those same types of characteristics that a lot of hymn melodies from these earliest days of hymn writing in the Reformation have. So kind of an angular tune, very rhythmic, um, does not sing very well if you want to sing it slowly it has to be kind of peppy and you know bounce along at least that's how i've kind of always heard it Mm -hmm. um luther was really fond of both the tune and the text of this hymn um there's a quote of him saying that he thought it was composed by the holy ghost himself (laughs) so um you know he has some some nice things to say about this and uh and it became a pretty popular both hymn tune and text for Lutherans for hundreds of years. Um, Bach used this this tune in his cantatas 59 and 75. 
Um, he has a couple of wonderful settings of this tune just for the organ in his Leipzig Chorale Preludes, which are among um, probably some of the best liturgical organ literature that he wrote. Um, so this tune plays pretty large in Lutheran circles and has for many hundreds of years. If I had a dime for every time I said that tune needs to be metricized for congregational singing, I tell you, <laughs> you'd be I'd, so rich. I'd you know? be so wealthy, boy. Uh, I know. I, I know you're being sarcastic, but honestly, at the seminary, if I had a dime, I would have some money. There. <laughs> Let's but, take a look. Uh, anything else about um, "Come, Holy Ghost, God and Lord" before we move on to the next hymn? Uh, sure. Well, just a couple of brief themes from the text itself. Um, you know, there's a lot of themes that play well, again, with Pentecost. The unity of the Church in the Spirit would be a big one. Um, and with a lot of Luther's texts, you have some common themes that are running through. The idea of God keeping us free from error, teaching us uh, to know Him aright by His Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes so that we would know God as He makes Himself known in the Scriptures to abide in living faith, that we can bravely contend here on earth as we await the resurrection. Uh, all of these themes that are are typically Luther in his hymns come out in this hymn text. Just a great text, great tune. Mm -hmm. Our next hymn is actually listed twice. It's in the hymnal in Lutheran Service Book, uh, 498 and 499. Come Holy Ghost, Creator, Blessed. So it looks like, what, we have two melodies here? Is that right? Two tunes? Yes, that's that's right, and it's the same type of thing that we were just talking about with the Luther hymn, where the text on the right-hand side of the page, 499, is Veni Creator Spiritus, is the tune, um, which again is the old Gregorian chant melody, and then on the left side of the page, 498, is the more hymn, hymnic version of that melody. So um, the way that this is laid out in the hymnal is really pretty brilliant. Um, one of the things that we do at my church in Fort Wayne on Pentecost is I'll typically have the choir or whoever's singing that day um, take a couple of stanzas by themselves, and I'll have them sing the chant melody on 499, and then I'll have the congregation sing the other stanzas out of 498. Um, and it's very simple to do, but it provides some nice variety, and you get... You know, you're kind of jumping out of time and going back a thousand years and listening to this wonderful chant and then jumping right back into the hymn. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of fun, I think, the way that those two settings have really been juxtaposed right next to each other in the hymnal. Yeah, our church, uh, we, I've done that too. And I think, I don't know if it's an arrangement or if we just, uh, if, if our church music director arranged it for i don't remember what it was but we used uh handbells too um so we would okay. actually chant 499 uh with handbells and that was real that's a cool effect too it's really fun. yes it is i agree we've done a little bit of that as well and it is fun to throw those things in there and it highlights you know what the choir is singing too mm -hmm. you just have a different sound to point people to what's going on. Yeah. So with with this text, uh, so many of these Pentecost hymns have very similar titles. Uh, but what is what is different or unique about this text? Well, this text is is actually more ancient than the previous text. Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned that the first stanza of four ninety seven is Luther's translation, but stanzas two and three are Luther himself. This hymn predates that uh, considerably. At one point, the text was really kind of attributed to Charlemagne, which mm. would have been like 8th, 9th century. Mm. Gregory the Great, for a while, was, was said to have written this. That would have been like in the 6th century. Ambrose of Milan, he was around in the 300s, so 4th century. And then finally, uh, Rabanus Morris. And he's kind of now been the one, uh, a Catholic, a priest, bishop, monk, um, who most people think wrote this text, but still then that predates Luther by five, six hundred years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very old text, and it has a lot of, I think, very vivid kind of Pentecost imagery in it. Um, this text in some ways maybe tells the story more than the Luther text does, but really unpacks what the Spirit has done in Pentecost and what he continues to do in the Church. Um, so you've got a link to the first Pentecost where you're talking about tongues of fire proclaiming. It's anointing the soul. 
uh, you have the text, to you, the counselor, we cry, and that takes us back to John's account of Jesus in the upper room, you know, promising the disciples, I'll send you the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the counselor, who will guide you into all truth. Um, I think my favorite little snippet in this whole hymn is the end of stanza four. Let me just read stanza four to you because it's, it's very brief. Your light to every thought in part and shed your love in every heart. The weakness of our mortal state with deathless might invigorate. I just love that. The weakness of our mortal state with deathless might invigorate. So, you know, what the Spirit is doing to us all the time and, and began that work on Pentecost with the apostles. You know, he is, is taking our own, you know, mortal bodies, these weak, weak shells of what we should have been in Eden, and he's invigorating them with deathless might. And how is he doing that? He's pointing us to Christ. And by pointing us to Christ, we know the Father, we know the Son, and we recognize the work of the Spirit. And we're empowered to take part in that work here on earth, but then also realizing that there is a might at work in us that will allow us to never die. We'll live forever because of that. It's Our, just, ooh. We're all out of time. Our <laughs> guest today, Matt Mockmer, <laughs> Associate Cantor, Concordia <laughs> Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. Thank you so much, Matt, for being our guest today on The Coffee Hour. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Happy Pentecost. Happy Pentecost to you, too. I'm so sad we didn't get to 501. I know. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golson. Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere.